Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now. I'm your host, Hannah Zaberi, and you're watching us on Muslim Network TV. Muslim Network TV broadcasts 24 7 on Galaxy 19 satellite, Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Today, our topic is going to be Palestine. There have been a lot of new developments that have been happening in the past month. And we are really excited today to welcome our guest, Mohammed Hebbe, um, who is with American Muslims for Palestine. And we're going to be catching up with him about the developments, um, getting American Muslims for Palestine's response, uh, how Palestinians in the Holy Land are responding to what is happening around them in the Arab world, and also what we here in the United States can do to make sure we're giving our best to Palestinian advocacy. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for being here today. And, uh, you know, how are you doing? How's everything been for you? Alhamdulillah, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel that long ago that we were here for another reason. Yes. Um, and it's it's great to be back. And I'm, I'm really glad that you guys and JFA now is, is willing to cover these important topics. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Now you're, you know, you have been just a, a little reminder for our audience. Um, Mohammed is a Palestinian American community organizer, and uh, he's been working. Uh, you know, he serves as the national development coordinator for American Muslims for Palestine, which is a national organization here in the United States. So, Mohammed, um, many of us uh, have been watching what is happen. What is happening currently? Uh, with UAE and Israel, um, with apprehension, disgust, uh, we've seen uh, heartbreak. Uh, I mean, I've seen all sorts of reactions, and some of it, some pe folks are actually looking at this like, okay, we expected this, right? Mm -hmm. So I would love to um, ask your perspective. Uh, can you share with us, let's go back and like actually talk about what has transpired um, in regards to UAE and Israel relations. Of course, of course. And I think you hit the, the nail on the head right there when you said that, you know, some people aren't surprised. And of course, even if you're not surprised, there is still a large amount of disappointment in what we're seeing now. Uh, at the last time we were out here, the last time I was I was with you guys, we talked about the uh, annexation plans in the West Bank. And many of us know that the reason why the UAE was able to come out with this deal and come out with this announcement in the time that it did was because of the annexation plans. Initially, the UAE deal was, uh, was basically a pledge to come out in the open with these new ideas of economic and security coordination between the two countries. Uh, the UAE, of course, has had a relationship with Israel for over two decades now. Um, whether it had been under the books, whether it had been only for security, it, it has been known that the UAE and Mohammed bin Zayed, their current leader, have had this idea of bringing this, uh, this relationship with Israel to the forefront. And initially when this announcement came out, there wasn't any teeth to it. There wasn't anything clearly stated of what these countries were going to be doing together. Mm -hmm. uh, we already knew the relationship that they had in the past uh, with their security coordination and their, their different dealings. Uh, many of us know that the UAE has had a policy of allowing um, Israelis to come to the UAE, Israeli ministers had come to the UAE multiple times in the past. Um, and now with their relationship with, with Trump and their relationship with Kushner, uh, it was easier to bring this deal out. And the perfect excuse came up for them by saying that the reason why we're going to make this deal is to suspend the annexation. And the day they announced this, the day they said that the reason we don't want to do this is because we don't want the West Bank to be annexed. Mm -hmm. Israel came out and said, you know what? We're, we're suspending it, but we're, we're still going to do this. 
Mm. Yeah, who still came out and he he gave a nice long speech about his respect for America and that at the end of the day, he's always going to do what's best for Israel. Israel. He said that at the end of the day, we're still going to annex the West Bank. We're still going to do what we promised because we uh, we're not going to stop this for anything. And it's it's, it's very telling, you know, even even uh, in this relationship where the UAE is is trying to show that they're an equal partner, Israel was quick to show that they're not. Israel was quick to show that at the end of the day, we're going to have a relationship on our terms and only our terms. And can you talk a little bit about, uh, there, I know there was an arms deal that was mm -hmm. part of this equation as well. Can you share with the audience what, what exactly uh, was the arms deal angle? So uh, many of us understand that uh, one of the reasons why the UAE and some of the other Gulf countries believe that they need to cozy up to Israel is because of their standing right now with Iran. They believe that to be able to deal with Iran and to deal with the problems of Iran, uh, they need to be better equipped and have better allies in the region. Um, unfortunately, uh, by dealing with Israel, one of the things that they're looking for is to be able to get more arms. Um, and of course, they've been buying for years now from America, but there's only a certain uh, there's a certain limit that comes up uh, when dealing with America. Uh, one of the things that I found very interesting is uh, that they were looking for, for certain types of planes, different types of helicopters and things like that. But one of the deals was for the F-35s. And uh, Israel was very quick to say that the UAE cannot have those. Oh, you know, wow. They're trying to get the best in line material. And Israel's already been rejecting a lot of them, which has been bothering, uh, which has been bothering uh, the UAE very much. But at the same time, the, the security coordination is taking a new level. Uh, there was an announcement earlier last week where they announced that they were going to uh, be building a security base uh, for Israel and the UAE and the Yemeni island of Sakatra. Mm. Uh, and this is something that's coming to fruition now as we speak. So it's... And all of this, so at the end of the day, what does UAE get out of this? They're not getting uh, their, their F-36, uh, F-35 deal is is being hindered. Um, what are they getting out of this, this uh, announcement? So right now the UAE was in a bit of hot water with, with the US because of their dealings with, um, their dealings with China. As we know, the bigger picture on the foreign policy scale right now is that the U.S. and China haven't had good relations in all over the world. Mm -hmm. And now that the UAE and China were cozying up together, the only way for the UAE to make sure that they don't lose this relationship with America is to essentially do this three-party deal, uh, which would make it easier for America to use some of their ports, which would make it easier for them to allow the U current U.S. president to show off that he created some sort of peace deal. Mm. But the biggest thing for the UAE is the economic side of this. Obviously, security is important to them, but being able to have a deal with Israel and cozying up more to America, being considered a strong ally, uh, some of the rhetoric that was used uh, with uh, the UAE uh, was very strong, considering them a very strong, helpful ally. So definitely, they they're benefiting it, uh, benefiting from it on um, on a propaganda side. Uh, but the economic um, assistance that they're getting out of this is going to be important from uh, for them. So now that they have an open trading and open uh, deals with Israel, they're going to be able to make money. Um, I'm sure they're going to become a, a, a tourist. Uh, destination. Uh, the UAE actually has one of the largest synagogues in the Middle East. So they're, they've, uh, they've made the country very welcoming. So we're, um, we're seeing that uh, th this might be a very good economic opportunity for them as well. And most likely it will be. Now, uh, Palestinians have obviously condemned the deal as a stab in the back uh, mm -hmm. from a major, uh, what 
some may have considered a major player, a major um, or a backer. Uh, you know, there are still people who are naive enough to think that the UAE is for the Palestinians, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what have you heard from the ground? What sort of um, uh, responses have you seen? Definitely the, the main thing is that as, as Palestinians, we're trying to, one, continue our existence, face our oppressor, uh, face the oppression that we're going through. And at the same time, we're seeing people who are supposedly on our side, who are supposedly claiming that the reason why they're going to hurt us and go against us is for our own benefit doing this to us. So it, it creates a, a large amount of distrust and a large amount of, uh, of hurt on the Palestinian side. The Palestinians, of course, uh, whether it be the PA or the Palestinians who are just on the ground, have been trying to fight off the annexation. And we're sitting here trying to deal with annexation. Uh, the PA has, has cut security coordination and, and different things with Israel to try to stop annexation and to try to curb it to a certain extent. And here we see an Arab country coming out and rewarding them by giving them this free photo op uh, and, and giving them the image that they want. Like, you know what? The only people who can't really get along with Israel are the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Everyone else did it. And it's important to note, Israel, is, uh, the UAE isn't the first uh, country to open a relationship mm -hmm. with Israel. Uh, Egypt has done it before, and uh, Jordan has done it before. But the difference was that Jordan and Egypt had both fought Israel uh, to a certain extent. They've participated in wars. Egypt, multiple wars uh, against, uh, against Israel uh, when Israel attempted to occupy and attack um, Egypt in, in, in the multiple wars, which led to their eventual peace deal. But that peace deal wasn't accepted by the Egyptian people. Uh, the Egyptian people stood against it, protested against it. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened when Jordan did it. The people stood against it. The people still stand against it. And Jordan, uh, some Jordanian ministers and uh, different people in Jordan have stood against the current deal going on right now in the UAE. Mm -hmm. But what, what makes the UAE deal a, a bit special is that the UAE has never fought, uh, never fought Israel. Yeah. No, no Emiratis, no people from the UAE, from the Emirates have ever come out and fought and stood against Israel like that, like, like uh, the countries around them have, Jordan and Egypt. So it's, it's very weird to call it a peace deal when there was never war. Uh, to start with. Right, right. Oh, that's that's interesting. That's a very, um, that's a deep point because, uh, so what is it making it sound again, you, the narrative? The narrative mm -hmm. is the, the peaceful Arabs versus the bad Arabs, right? Like mm -hmm. that. And this is part of that whole, uh, and we see this around the world where Muslims are being or put into these labels, these boxes that these are the good, good Muslims versus the the radicals. So this is part of that that same mm -hmm. narrative. And so now UAE um, is considered uh, the you know the good Arab. So yeah. um, yes, exactly. And it's it's horrible to see, but it's something that's been perpetuated for a while. And what makes the UAE deal uh, as well a bit interesting is that the the Gulf and the Arab League had had initiatives in the past to start building relationships with Israel. So mm -hmm. the Gulf started building relationships with Israel after the signing of the Oslo Agreement uh, back in uh, the early 90s. And the, so that's when they started their security coordinations. They started uh, under the table deals with Israel and things like that. Uh, after after 2000 and 2002, um, the Arab League talked about uh, certain initiatives they could do to start building a relationship with Israel. And their key was that they would be able, they would allow any Arab country that wished to build a relationship with Israel, as long as Israel was willing to leave uh, the West Bank and go back to the 1967 borders. Of course, the Palestinians weren't very supportive of this, mm -hmm. um, but it was a deal that was offered and Israel refused it. Israel refused it in the beginning. Uh, and until this day, they uh, I'm sure they would still refuse this type of deal 
uh, which has been reaffirmed twice since since it started about 18 years ago. This was uh, this was an offer given by the Arab League. What we're seeing now from the UAE is they've even given up on that deal, which was a deal that didn't even look that good itself. The UAE has given off on that deal and has decided on their own that they're going to build a relationship no matter who likes it or who's against it. Mm. We've also seen that the UAE is now trying to bring other Arab countries in, and the U.S. is trying to bring other uh, Arab countries in. Yeah, uh, like, um, meeting with um, Kushner and uh, Qatar, um, and uh, and that also so, seemed to, even though UAE and Qatar are at opposite ends in in the Arab spectrum, in the Middle Eastern spectrum, um, they are uh, quite frankly enemies. Um, but this was very interesting to watch that their uh, reaction or their their they were also talking normalization. Mm -hmm. uh, so Qatar Qatar might be on the longer list. Mm -hmm. They have definitely a shorter list that they expect people to um, start signing on sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. One of the countries, Sudan, uh, Mike Pompeo. Uh, recently met with the uh, heads of Sudan mm -hmm. and talked to them about the possibility of signing a similar agreement. Um, we also see countries like Bahrain, uh, countries like Oman, who would also be interested in something like this. Bahrain and Oman both uh, supported the deal, came out and, and congratulated the UAE for coming to it. So we might see it with a few of the smaller players within the region. Uh, but I do think we're not far off from seeing something similar coming out from Saudi, even though Saudi was the first or uh, first country to support the initial 2002 um, uh, initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were the ones who started it. They could also possibly fall into this. But and I think the new leadership in Saudi, right? The uh, leadership yes. has changed. The tone has changed. A lot has changed. Uh, and at least there used to be a facade of um, that the previous Saudi leadership of Ummah leadership and the Ummah and all of that. But with this, with MBS, uh, that facade has come off and it's um, and allow people can see what the real story is in Saudi. Um, and even with this, um, she, um, when Kushner met with Sheikh Tamim of Qatar, uh, they said they have said that they remain committed to the 2002 peace uh, Arab peace initiative. So mm -hmm. uh, this is something. So as as you you said that this is. So what are you? How are you gearing up for different announcements? Um, did this one take you all by surprise? And now are you guys prepping for the rest? Tell us what uh, what's happening at American Muslims for Palestine in response. So, so at American Muslims for Palestine, we released an official statement that could be uh, seen on our website, but we weren't really, uh, to say the least, um, amused uh, by this at all. Uh, unfortunately, um, the the rhetoric that came out with it and, and the way that it was pushed out, uh, it seemed very hollow and empty. Uh, mm -hmm. from what we've seen and what we've said. Of course, the, the official statement of AMP could be found on our website, but mm -hmm. speaking um, speaking as uh, an American organizer, uh, a person surrounded by other American organizers, we've seen a lot of, um, uh, uh, not to say uh, surprise, but more disappointment than anything else. Um, like I said, that the UAE has had open relationships and uh, has had uh, had a sort of relationship with Israel for a while. They also supported uh, the deal of the century when it was announced. They were one of the first Arab countries to come out and support it. So we see. How do they justify this? How do they? What is their justification? What do they say to Palestinians? Recently, there was a delegation of Palestinians that met with leadership in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and they assured Palestinians that um, the ties don't come at the expense of Ramallah and uh, Abu Dhabi still supports the establishment of a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. 
I mean, so of course that's just going along with the lines that were drawn up during the uh, the deal of the century. That's going all along with the rhetoric that Israel's been giving. Uh, but I would add that it was also very telling that the UAE refused to speak to the Palestinian Authority beforehand. They weren't given a heads up that this was going to happen. They were doing it whether the Palestinian Authority liked it or not. Um, and uh, of course, it makes sense. Um, the, the fact that it came out, uh, I think the day it came out, not many people saw it coming, but it wasn't surprising. Uh, if if that were to make sense, hmm. but we've seen since uh, since this announcement, uh, we've seen a lot of organization. You know, of course, this announcement is comes straight from the annexation plan that Israel announced in July. As it comes straight from that, we've seen a lot of people stepping up against annexation and stepping up against uh, this normalization. Uh, of course, um, we uh, many of us may know Congresswoman Betty McCollum. Mm -hmm. uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum put out one of the first uh, bills in support of Palestine uh, in the past. A few years back, she put out a bill that would help support Palestinian children uh, and uh, fight against the illegal targeting and uh, the arrest and the jailing of them. Um, after the, uh, it, it actually came out in August as well, in, in early August as well. Uh, Congresswoman McCollum came out with a bill um, that is, uh, is, is set to stand up and fight against annexation. Um, this bill would penalize Israel for going through with annexation. So this bill is called the, um, uh, this bill is called the, um, um, I apologize. Uh, so this uh, bill is called the Israeli Annexation Non-Recognition Act. Okay. Um, it is the strongest bill to ever come out uh, to stand against Israel in U.S. history. Uh, it's a bill that speaks clearly and justly about Palestinian rights. Uh, it's a bill that speaks clearly of what are the consequences if Israel were to go out and uh, continue the annexation. Um, this act would basically prohibit any U.S. funding to any area in the occupied West Bank that is annexed by Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Congresswoman was very clear uh, that she believes that we deserve peace, security, equality, and, uh, and justice. And she led um, the, this groundbreaking bill uh, something that the the amount of pushback on this uh, and teeth on this bill hasn't been seen before in regards to Israel. And it started off with, with some very important support, names that we know in Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, Mark Pocan, Ilhan Omar, uh, uh, Andre Carson, all uh, signed on to this bill from, from day one. So it's a very important bill uh, that has come out. And of course, uh, the fact that it came out in the first place is important for us. Yes. Uh, that to have a bill like that, that is historic for it to be introduced, for it to be, um, shown. I mean, just to get it on the, on the floor that to have that's so, um, Yes, we're going to. Yes, um, I think we have a uh, supporter who knows the bill number HR 8050. Um, thank you, Malak. And um, so tell us more about the details of this bill. So as as you stated, just circling around uh, back around the fact that this is even on the floor is important for us because now we have saved into Congress and into the official congressional record uh, that we are, that there is an amount of, uh, congressional Democrats and, uh, congressional representatives who are standing out against what Israel is planning to do. Uh, this, this bill's plan is, uh, is of course to make sure that American money isn't used in this annexation, isn't provided as a support. Uh, and it's very clear in that. As well as that, the 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 bill itself uh, does 
does a lot to promote equality. Um, the, the significant language that's used in it uh, is talking about human rights uh, and equality and expressing uh, Palestinian opposition to the Israeli occupation. Exactly. Um, McCollum said that uh, Palestinians, Israelis, uh, deserve peace, security, equality, and justice. Annexation is antithetical to these goals. I reject Israeli annexation. I condemn annexation. I will work to ensure that the U.S. does not support, defend, or legitimize any plans to illegally annex Palestinian land. Of course, of yeah. course. And very strong words coming mm -hmm. from a congresswoman uh, who has always been a staunch supporter of human rights. Uh, as I said before, she was also the first congresswoman to release a bill in support of Palestinian rights in the past as well. And alhamdulillah, uh, I would I would add, and, and this is, if there's a, a main point we need to take out of this, is even though all these problems are going on still in Palestine and we're seeing annexation and we're seeing, for lack of a better term, the selling out of people who are uh, supporting us and or, or supposedly needing to support us, we're still finding ways to stand up for what we believe in is right. And we here in America, we live in, of course, we live in the country that gives the largest amount of support and financial support to Israel. You know, we're the reason why they're able to make these deals with the Arab nations. And it's, it's important for us as Palestinians, as Muslims, as people who support justice in general. Mm -hmm. You know, we're here on Justice for All now. As people who support justice, we need to be able to use our privilege here in this country to be able to support our people around the world. And, you know, I, I know you guys have talked about many issues going on around the world, whether it be the Uyghurs, the Kashmiris, the Rohingya, and Palestine as well. But I'm, I'm saying now that we as, as people must use our privilege in this country to be able to fight for justice. And that takes me to my final point. We, we mentioned earlier, I, I work with American Muslims for Palestine. We're a national organization that educates and advocates for Palestine here in this country. AMP has been doing some tremendous work uh, here in this country in education and advocacy. And we've seen uh, since our beginning uh, in the late 2000s, a shift in how America uh, and the American view of Palestine has been going. We've been seeing more and more support. Mm -hmm. One of our, uh, one of our uh, flag mark or uh, um, events is our Palestine Advocacy Day. This is an event that we've doing we've been doing for the past five years, where we bring people from all over the country to come support Palestine in Washington, DC. What we typically do is we train, we educate, and give people the tools they need to be able to discuss with their, uh, to be able to talk to their Congress people, to their representatives and their senators, and tell them that what they need in support of Palestinian rights. This year, initially, we were planning to do this event in March. It was uh, planned out to be our largest event yet. But unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we were unable to uh, safely bring people to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Instead, we have now pushed this event to uh, September, inshallah. It will be from September 14th through the 18th, and it will be virtual. This is our first ever virtual Palestine Advocacy Day, and we're going out of our way to make sure that it is uh, comfortable and easy for people to participate in. Uh, day one, inshallah, is going to be our advocacy uh, training sessions. Day two is going to be our congressional plenary. Uh, we showed that, uh, that image uh, a little bit earlier, uh, where we have uh, about five Congress people expected to speak as well as some well-respected activists as well. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're hoping inshallah that we will be able to mobilize our community to come out for this event. You know, we've been talking about, uh, we've been talking about these issues and we do a very good job of identifying what our issues are, not only as Palestinians, but as, as justice seekers in general, we know what our issues are. Mohammed, um, so tell, talk to us a little bit about this training because uh, you know I've heard a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
what are the components of the training? Uh, I understand some of it is like a lot of lay people who've never uh, done advocacy, who've never interacted with their con con congressional staff, never even thought that Palestine could even be discussed in a meeting with congressional mm -hmm. staff. So tell us a little bit more about the trainings that you do and tell us what has been, how has the, just those meetings, have, have, how have they changed over the years? So uh, the the training specifically is is to equip people with the skills they need so that they'll be able to not only effectively meet with their representatives and meet with uh, meet with their lawmakers, but we also give them the tools for them to be able to effectively do it on their own. Um, initially, uh, what we do is we talk about how to run a meeting, how to be able to be in, in involved. Uh, and uh, be able to get your points across. And we talk specifically about the uh, the bills that were uh, the bills and, and the uh, different things that we're promoting on on that day and on the hill. So, for instance, uh, we spoke. I spoke today about two bills that are very important to Palestine. Uh, for example, we would be able to use one of those and go into that in depth and be able to teach people how to talk about it and how to discuss it when on the Hill. Um, as well as that, we we pride ourselves in being able to give our community uh, the ability to speak to their Congress people. For the longest time, many people in the Muslim community and the Arab community were, weren't comfortable going to their lawmakers, weren't comfortable going to uh, their uh, congressional representatives. We pride ourselves in being able to give our people a voice and take them themselves to be able to do this. So, uh, of course, for, for more information, please feel free to go on to uh, palestineadvocacy.com, uh, check out our information, check out what we have set. Uh, we have two, uh, we have, uh, two full days um, of, of different uh, trainings and our congressional plenary. Uh, and we definitely hope that you guys will be able to come uh, and benefit from this event. Uh, registration will be ending soon. We're trying to get as many people as possible. Please log on to palestineadvocacy.com for more information, inshallah. When does um, registration end? It'll be uh, ending on the 8th, inshallah. 8th, inshallah. So, you know, we talk about this a lot and uh, a lot of people, uh, especially those who sometimes feel like yes other issues we can discuss with our con congress but palestine is something that is off the table and this is something that i wanted to you know want it like share with us those changes just the fact that they're not congress people who are coming to mm -hmm. palestinian events and are willing to speak and there's just uh, you know more people who recognize uh, that this is an issue that can be talked about and um, mm -hmm. are not falling for the one, um, you know, narrative that IPAC has been um, sharing throughout, right? So tell us, like, you know, I, I want to share like some of those tidbits, those juicy, like, mm -hmm. yes, that was a big change. Like we call this office and we actually got a meeting instead of people like, mm -hmm. you know, oh, no one is available to meet with you. That sort of like, I know those changes are happening. So mm -hmm. encourage our audience that get involved. You know, your this fight has been a really long fight. And now that things are um, progressing, we need to not stop here. We need to keep pushing. So share that with us. So definitely. Um, I remember the first time I, I came out to DC, I wasn't even <laughs> at the time. And I remember going to some offices and, and dealing with some people who, you know, initially weren't understanding the points we wanted to bring up. You know, when, when we first started coming, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's funny because we didn't even have bills that were in support of us. Mm -hmm you know, that were supporting us. We were going and asking them not to push more bills that were hurting us at the time. And now here we are pushing two bills in support of, of, of Palestinians. Now here we are with a, an actual Palestinian woman in Congress, um, the, the first Palestinian woman uh, in Congress. And she was able to, um, you know, get into Congress and do some amazing work. Uh, we also see 
that more and more people are willing to talk now. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something that's that's very support uh, that's very surprising because you know when when we first started, um, the amount of people who wanted to talk about Palestine weren't much. Getting meetings isn't the hard part, but getting meetings where people are willing to listen more was, was very hard in the beginning. Now I feel that you know if we reach out to if if I personally am to reach out to my congressman, I'll get a meeting with him and he'll be involved in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And this is something that Palestinian activists around the country have been seeing, you know. And and, and I just wanted to point out that when we talk when we say Palestinian advocates. You don't have to be a Palestinian to be a Palestinian advocate. Mm-hmm. Like clarify that for I, I look a lot. I know here locally in uh, in my area, some of the biggest, most pushiest Palestinian activists are definitely not Palestinian. They're mm-hmm. they're Jewish. Um, they're Pakistani Americans. They're uh, they're Black Americans, and it's 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 just that is like the most. Uh, vibrant part of this advocacy work that 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 palestinian activists mm-hmm. may not be palestinian of course you, you know surprisingly because of uh the ties that we have as as muslims to to this cause we've always seen the most supportive religion in america to palestine are, are the muslims 100 percent. and you know we've seen in the recent years uh we've seen a growing amount of younger individuals of different backgrounds, of diverse backgrounds, whether they be black, brown, uh, white, Jewish, we've been seeing a growing amount of younger Americans coming out and supporting. You know, there have been a, a, a lot of stats done that talk about how uh, millennials are more likely to be supportive of Palestine, and now Gen Z is is definitely the most supportive of Palestine. So we've been seeing a lot of push. We've been seeing a, a great amount of change. Right now we're at a point in this country where we're talking about taking money away from Israel. Mm-hmm. You know, this was rhetoric that was brought up by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It's now being put into a bill by Congresswoman Betty McCollum. And so we we need to be able to uh, celebrate these victories. You know, at the end of the day, these victories took took dedicated individuals and a good amount of time. But we're seeing now that we're getting to the side where this is becoming more of a debate instead of us being just preached to. And we're getting to where we want to be. And the only way we could keep getting better is if we all come out and we all support as much as we can. That's why AMP is doing this virtual Palestine Advocacy Day, so that we as Americans can come out and show our support for the Palestinian people, no matter where we are. And this year, it's out of the comfort of our own homes. So definitely, we look forward to having as many people as possible, inshallah. True, and and so we've been doing a lot of these virtual advocacy, and it, it's so e- it's so much easier now because you don't have mm-hmm. to fly out. You don't have to. You can actually just join in on a Zoom call or a phone call, a Senate line or a House line, and. And they just, and you know, a lot of times people may be intimidated going into the offices, uh, but here, when you're virtually doing it, you're free to speak your mind, uh, you're free to demand. And the fact that there a lot of um, younger folks are getting involved, which, which what I see is the demand is stronger. Like the, the language that is used is not that, oh, please do this. I demand you to do this because you are my elected official. I helped elect you. Um, you know, so that that is that's a shift, and we need to consistently push on that shift because, as you know, um, our our local uh, one of our local elected official Congress people over here, Stanley Hoyer, says, "Hey, this system is made to be lobbied." So that means anybody can lobby. That it's a, it's it's like mm-hmm. it's open to anybody, right? So that is like, that's the least we can do. So American Muslims for Palestine is doing all the hard work for you. They're getting the meetings. They're getting um, the, uh, you know, they put everything together and they're even well, going to train you. So all you all have to do is get in, you know, get on the phone and get on those meetings. Mm-hmm. Now, if, if someone is not, has not taken the training can they still attend the meetings is that an option or do they have to take the training before so we require anyone who's uh registered and planning to attend these meetings to uh join uh, to join in in the training 
Uh, unfortunately, the, the only way you'll be prepared is if you attend this training. Okay, and, and tell us why. Why do you feel that way? Because, uh, of course, uh, not only is it because of the re the bills that we're, we're discussing and the issues that we're discussing, but it's also because you'll be able to get an insight into one who's going to be with you in these meetings. Mm -hmm. As well as that, it will also uh, it will also help to get some more background information on how your congressmen or how your senators uh, have been acting towards this issue in the, uh, before. So there's a lot of, of, of detail that's going into these trainings. Uh, it's also being led by by some amazing people. Uh, we have some representatives uh, and some people from UNRWA USA, uh, JVP, uh, as well as uh, the NAACP who will uh, be joining in uh, and helping prepare our attendees for the upcoming, uh, uh, the upcoming meetings and uh, to help support them as well. There's something really important, which I really want to focus on. The fact that knowing where your congressperson stood beforehand, mm -hmm. what their statements have been about this, you know, calling them out on those statements, calling them out and saying, okay, that just shows that, constituents are aware they're watching they're they're listening and they're going to keep that in mind next time they go out and vote so that is something and for them not to take your vote for granted um that you know because that's another thing and we had this discussion on the show earlier when a biden's team reached out uh you know on uh, on the foreign mm -hmm. policy issue and then uh brought in the muslim liaison instead of the foreign policy liaison to the meeting and so that was something that we discussed here, that if we don't push now and if we do not demand that these uh, you know, Congress folks, um, people running for office, even run for president, should not take the Muslim vote for granted or should not take up any vote for granted. Mm -hmm. And and these issues need to and if you if we don't push now and people are saying, oh, you know, um, push for them now and we'll hold their toes to the fire later. But I disagree with that. I just I feel like we need to push now so that we can hold their toes to the fire later. What are you going to ask of them if we, you do not make any asks right now? Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so what are you going to hold them to after they get elected? So th that's something that um, I really wanted to. So that's that's you know, so that's the importance of the trainings is for people to actually know. And then it also forms that bond, like once you leave, right? And then that group of people that you went in to the meeting with, now you might not know, know them before. Mm -hmm. Now you can go back into your communities and organize and keep organizing for um, Palestine in your own areas and coordinate with other folks who might be in your district, in your, in, in you know, ha be, have the same um, congressperson. So that's super important as well. Of course, of course, definitely, inshallah. And, and like I said, this is going to be our, our largest one yet. And we're, we're hoping as many people as possible can join in. Uh, thankfully, it's at the comfort of your home uh, and it's only $10 to register. So, Inshallah, hopefully anyone watching will be able to benefit and come through uh, and, and join us in supporting Palestinian rights here in America. For more information, again, go on to palestineadvocacy.com and we look forward to seeing you all there. So as we wrap up this um, our hour, one thing that I did want to ask you about that was in development as well that I didn't have a chance um, was um, please explain to us what has happened with the Palestinian Authority and them cut, cutting ties with Israel, uh, which happened in May. Um, what has transpired? What does that mean for the people on the ground? So when we when we talk about the Palestinian Authority, it's very important to understand some of the some of the context beforehand. Uh, the Palestinian Authority always had uh, security coordination and uh, an open relationship with Israel. They worked uh, they worked with them a lot and they basically represented the Palestinian people in them. Uh, as they were continuously undermined and all these, uh, all these announcements of annexation were coming out, um, 
the Palestinian Authority started taking away and refusing certain things. So there was a certain amount of money that Israel would be giving them. They refused to. Uh, they refused to keep taking that, uh, even though it was a large amount of their annual budget. So right now the PA is is um, is losing money uh, because of this, as well as that they've been stopping their security coordination. But of course, at the end of the day, um, as much as the PA can do, it's not as it's it, one. It's it's not enough to stop Israel from continuing the occupation and continuing the oppression of Palestinian people or or the upcoming annexation. Um, but they're they're trying to do what they think they can or, or what they have the ability to do. Of course, at the end of the day, Israel, if they, Israel is continuing the occupation, they're still present uh, in the uh, West Bank and they're still present uh, in the areas that they plan to annex. Uh, so it's definitely uh, it's definitely something that the PA has been doing, but it's not something that's been showing results as of yet. Mm. So this is um, uh, you know we're we're on the line. If anybody has any questions and they'd like to um, ask questions of Mohammed about uh, the Advocacy Day, um, about uh, the bill itself, uh, and or about stuff that is happening on the ground in Palestine, please do, uh, you know, thank you all so much for watching. And, um, you know, we're broadcasting on several uh, Facebook pages. Uh, and this is, you know, hopefully we'll be broadcasting this tomorrow on Muslim Network TV as well. So this is, you know, and it's so important that we keep talking. Like a lot of times people get, you know, are have um, issue fatigue. Mm -hmm. and they, 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 they're like, why do you keep harping on about the same issue over and over and over again? Or, you know, why is it so important to keep talking about the recent developments? But this is like, where else are you going to see this? Like, I, we're not going to turn on ABC News and be having a conversation about Palestinian advocacy. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen in the near future anytime mm -hmm. soon, right? Not yet, but hopefully. Hopefully, soon. hopefully one day. Huh? One day we'll get mm -hmm. there. So at least uh, we need to continue to have these conversations because it, it's, you know, a lot of times when people keep informed and keep recognizing that things are changing and there isn't, like a lot of people lose hope. Uh, so just like the positive uh, achievements that have happened have to be highlighted too. Mm -hmm. And so just this um, bill HR 8050 is just such a big major accomplishment. And I congratulate you guys on that because I know how hard it is to introduce a resolution or a bill um, into Congress, especially something as, um, you know, as they, they like to call it as um, controversial uh, as uh, Israel, Israel and uh, Palestine. So this, you know, as we wrap up the show, thank you again, Mohammed, for being here. Please go to Palestine, palestineadvocacy.com and register. Um, and inshallah, we are going to continue uh, to, uh, you know, call for this for support for this very important cause. Um, as well as please do visit Justice for All. We do have some exciting news. Three political prisoners were released in India. Actually, two were released and one is still awaiting bail. Dr. Kafil Khan has been released from prison in, um, in uh, the Mathura jail uh, in Uttar Pradesh, as well as Shirjil Usmani, who is a PhD student at JNU University who has been incarcerated. He was released on bail, and we're awaiting the news of for Hans uh, He's been granted bail, but has not been released yet. So I wanted to share that good news with you all. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, and inshallah, we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.